Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my 2022 Toyota GR86. This is the base trim, got it for $28,000 MSRP in Utah, and then drove it all the way back down to Vegas in July of 2022. And for those who don't know, I actually owned a 2013 Scion FRS for nine years as my one and only vehicle from the age of what, 22 to 20 or 31. And I love the platform, I love the chassis, the, the second gen is mostly improved over the first gen, and I talk about how this first gen is actually better in a few ways in a previous video, but today we're talking long-term owner's review and why I might not be keeping this car. Now before we get into the meat of the video, let's first talk about the engine reliability issues because that is actually giving me a bit of hesitation with the ownership experience. So. I do a lot of track days. I've done a dozen track days at this vehicle and knock on wood, I've had no issues with this car so far. I only have 6,800 miles. And given the repeated engine failures, I'm getting concerned because it seems to be not a matter of if, but when you're gonna face catastrophic engine failure if you do track this car, if you do push it pretty hard. And if you guys have seen my track videos, I do push the car pretty hard. So what I have done for now is I plan on only tracking close to Las Vegas. So there's Pahrump, uh, has Spring, Spring Mountain. I go there very frequently. I actually instruct with Audi Club and Porsche Club there about half a dozen times per year. And then there's also LVMS, Las Vegas Motor Speedway. And I've done one track day there with Speed Ventures. And again, uh, at these track days, I'm, I'm generally instructing. So if you guys are gonna be at a track day, then, um, then let me know, maybe I'll see you out there. So the reason is that if I do face engine issues, it's gonna be a lot easier for me to tow my vehicle back to my house with my AAA membership versus if I'm at Button Willow or Chuckwalla, these tracks that are three, four, five, even eight hours away from where I live. Uh, I used to track my Scion FRS. First ever track day was actually at Laguna Seca. And if you face catastrophic engine failure there, you're, you're kind of hosed, right? If you're so far from home, unless you are towing your vehicle to the track, which I am not. My other vehicle is a Mazda CX-50, which cannot tow. I think the tow rating is around 3,000 pounds. This car alone weighs 2,800 pounds, and then you actually need the trailer. So I'm looking for at least 6,000 pounds of towing capacity before I actually start towing a vehicle to the track. Initially, when the car first came out, I wasn't that concerned, because yeah, these are super rare occurrences, but again, with the, the recent data, it does seem a little bit more concerning. Now, as for what I've done to the car, I've kept it mostly stock because the car is fantastic right from factory. I added a Jackson Racing oil cooler. I did NKTS 10 wheels, 17 by eight, and Kumho V730 tires. Also did the camber bolts in the front. So pretty close to stock, but that alone has addressed the main shortcoming I see with the vehicle being the lack of negative camber in the front, which really hinders the turn in, um, especially on track. So. That deficiency is still there somewhat, but the front end is much sharper. And this car is just such a pleasure to drive. Even after driving hundreds of cars with this channel, I, I actually appreciate this car more and more for what it is because the level of driving engagement and fun and reward that it gives you at an insanely affordable price of $28,000. Now I did add also cosmetically the ducktail spoiler. I really like that on the premium, but I couldn't find a premium in Neptune Blue, so I decided to just pull the trigger after waiting eight months. I was on the list and everything, but anyways, um, the things I do miss from the premium trim would be the blind spot detectors. I actually find that very helpful in my Mazda CX-50, which is my daily, and I know some people are saying, hey, there's a sports car, who needs blind spot detectors? Yeah, I mean, I can say the same thing about AC then, right? Uh, everyone has different preferences. I don't like rev match as an example. Some vehicles, some BMWs don't let you disable rev match unless you automatic rev match, unless you've also disabled traction control. So anyways, the side view uh, blind spot monitoring would have been helpful. The Alcantara on the interior is a lot nicer. I would have liked that, not a huge deal. Um, and then the, the headlights that change directions, I really don't care about that. 
but you know the seats and the Alcantara I think that would have been nice and the uh, the blind spot main things I would have enjoyed ducktail you can add aftermarket for about I think it was four hundred dollars maybe closer to five hundred dollars for the paint matched Neptune blue version and I have an installation video as well in case you guys want to try that out yourself very simple a lot of people ask about GR86 versus BRZ they're essentially the same car the front end is going to be different and the suspension is going to be a little bit different the suspension in the GR86 is a little bit harsher, especially in the rear, and you can feel that on, you know, city day-to-day -day driving. It's not going to be quite as comfortable as the BRZ, but given the looks and given the, the more oversteer pro nature of the suspension setup, I definitely prefer the GR86, but both are great vehicles. Now, things I like and don't like about the car. First is the steering wheel. Uh, having these buttons, I definitely prefer in the first gen not having buttons because sure, when you're just driving around town, it's completely fine. But if you're tracking this and you're really pushing it on track and you're getting it sideways and having to catch, you know, you know climber steer and all that stuff, then you're going to accidentally hit buttons, which can be annoying and it may actually change what you're displaying on your gauge cluster and you want to see your oil temp while you're tracking. So that's one thing I don't like. Uh, one thing I do like is that this... The cutout in the door for your water bottle is massive. I can fit this 40 ounce uh, Takaya in there, no problem, which is, I can't say the same about my Mazda CX-50 or my first gen FRS. I also don't love the throttle mapping because it's a little too aggressive. I think they did that in part to make the car feel more peppy, but you want a little bit more of a linear throttle response. And this almost feels like an on off switch because the first whatever it is, 20% of travel is where you have zero to 100% of actual throttle output. And of course, obviously, I love, love, love the driving dynamics. That's the main reason I bought this car. I mean, I think it looks great, but more importantly, I think it drives great. It drives fantastically. The inputs are phenomenal. Um, everything is really good. I actually rate all the vehicles that I review, and you can find them at jabalandcars.com, or you can check out the link in the description because we link it there in every car review video for your viewing pleasure. Some other things I like about the vehicle, it is so much more comfortable now than the first gen. The suspension isn't nearly as harsh, but it still maintains fantastic body control. And driving around town, way more comfortable. This was actually my daily for half a year before I bought the CX-50 uh, at the end of the year last year. And way more comfortable on the highway, not nearly as loud. And on the decibel meter, I think it was maybe four or five decibels quieter, maybe even more than that, but significantly quieter and suspension is also softer, not nearly as crashy. In most ways, it's an upgrade. I do miss the steering from the first gen, but everything else about this vehicle is essentially upgraded. Oh, another thing I don't like is the fake engine noise. So I actually unplugged the module on, on that side over there. And some people complain about not being able to hear the engine while on track. I personally haven't had any issues and I do rely on the actual visual shift light to help me with that too. Now, as for why I may get rid of the vehicle and replace it with something like an S2000 or something else a little more focused, I don't find myself driving the car that often. My Mazda CX-50, which I've had for about, what, half a year, is now at the same mileage as, as this. They're both around 7K miles. And I drive that vehicle because it's more comfortable, it's more practical when I go get groceries, when I'm driving with other people. It's just my go-to vehicle. And I don't drive this as often. And for that reason, I don't know if it's the best use case for my needs. Because as a single sports car for a young single guy, I think it is probably the best vehicle you can buy. It's incredibly practical, obviously not as practical as an SUV, but way more practical than a Miata, and you can actually use it as your one and only single vehicle. And now that I have a practical daily, I want something that is more extreme, more hardcore, more of an occasion when I drive it. Now, as you guys know, I've been on the waiting list for an Amira for almost two years, which is insane. Um, so that's coming. But I still want a cheaper FR platform vehicle as well that I can just really hammer and beat on on the track. And I'm considering an S2000. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that if I did not have a second vehicle, I would keep this even with the engine issues, but the engine issues combined with the desire for something more hardcore 
is pushing me towards S2000 or maybe some other hardcore FR platform, whether that's a tuned Miata or something else. Actually, if you guys have some suggestions, let me know with a comment below. But, but I do love these vehicles. I think they've done a phenomenal job with them, with the major exception being the reliability of the engine. But even, even the power delivery now is much better than first gen, no more torque dip, enough power that you don't feel like it's slow. If you are considering one of these, I would definitely recommend it. If you're gonna be tracking it frequently, I would say exercise some caution until we see how the situation unfolds with engine reliability issues with regards to uh, Toyota and Subaru and how they're gonna, you know, honor the warranties or, you know, repairs or if there's gonna be a recall. So if you're not gonna track it, I say this is one of, if not the best sports car you can get at this price point. I'm sure you can talk about muscle cars, but I've reviewed those on this channel. They they do not have anywhere near the same driving engagement as this. They're also way too heavy. This car is a little bit over 2,800 pounds, slightly heavier than the first gen, but finding a sub 3K sports car, FR, great inputs, it's just really hard to find. It's like this or Miata, and this is way more practical than the Miata, although the Miata is also a phenomenal vehicle. If it's your one and only car, it's gonna be a lot harder to manage and justify versus a car like this. And then also, as you guys know, I've, I did plastic surgery, and as a result, I'm extra afraid of UV and, and skin cancer because we operated on a lot of basal cell melanoma, squamous cell carcinoma, et cetera, et cetera. So having a hard top with tinted windows that block all UV radiation is how I generally prefer doing things anyways. My friends, what would you do if you were in my shoes? Would you replace your GR86? Do you think it's a good buy for most other people who are in their 20s? Let me know with a comment below. Much love, my friends. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all in the next one.